Welcome. We're honored to have you listen and participate in these dialogues produced by the Cora de Brautsaw Foundation. To learn more about the foundation and about how you can help us in our mission of unearthing untold stories of moral energy, please visit us at virtuesofpeace.com. There you can access show archives, show resources, visit our Etsy shop, and support us with a donation. Virtuesofpeace.com. Hello, and welcome to Virtues of Peace. My name is Hope Elizabeth May, and I'm joined tonight by Riley Olson. And we are here doing part four of our mini series on Bertha von Suttner's most famous book novel, Lay Down Your Arms. So this show is the fourth installment. And today we will be talking about chapters seven and eight. And these are on pages 141 to 186 on the complete text, which you can download at virtuesofpeace.com. Just click on the show resources page, find this show, and you'll see a link to the PDF. So the last show that we did was on May 18th, a few weeks ago. And we ended, and we also began that show, which was just on chapter six, with the very last sentence of chapter six. And I'm just going to bring us back up to speed that sentence chapter six closes with this sentence what a foolish world still in leading strings cruel unthinking this was the result of my historical studies that ends chapter six today we're talking about chapter seven and eight and just to remind you of the, give you some context of that sentence, it um, birth on this will, I think, come up again in today's discussion. Um, the main character, Martha von Tilling, uh, as Bertha creates her, is reading one history and two very a very specific kind of history, and that is the rationale for the war between. Austria and Denmark. Uh, and she goes back. So <clears throat> this is in the, the 1800s, really uh, 1864, 63-ish is where chapter six is. And she goes back and looks uh, to understand why this war is about to happen. Uh, and she ends up going back into like the 1300s and there are all these border disputes and it's not really clear. She says that number one and the important thing she says also will definitely be expanding on these themes more today as we talk about chapter seven and eight is okay, there are these treaties, it's unclear who is the rightful owner of this bit of land. Um, but even if it was clear, why do we, waste or expend blood and treasure on these kinds of border disputes. She doesn't really understand it. And that's really why she says, what a foolish world still in leading strings, cruel, unthinking. That in the hierarchy of values, which we'll definitely be talking about more in this show, it doesn't compute to her mind how you could destroy the bonds of family, the joys that you have with the people that you love, how they're called off by the state to, uh, you know, honor a treaty. She just doesn't get that. So <clears throat> um, in terms of where we are in the text, the, te the, the t uh, entire text, at least the English translation that we're using, which uh, I think is published in 1892, is 410 pages long. And we are almost halfway into the text uh, approaching it. So today, again, just chapter seven and eight. So chapter seven, we're in the year 1864. And what really happens in chapter seven is that uh, Martha's second husband, Frederick von Tilling, is called away to go to war. And Martha had to endure this. Uh, I think it's chapter two when she writes about the departure of her first husband, 
which is Arno Dotsky, um, that is in 1859. So five years has elapsed between the departure of her first husband, Arno, who dies in battle. Um, Martha mourns for approximately four years and she remarries Frederick von Tilling and now he's being called off to battle. And chapter seven is really about this and what happens to her. And it's, it's a very sad chapter. Um, the, the phrase, and we talked about this last week, post-traumatic stress disorder is not coined until the Vietnam War. Um, but I think definitely you see um, post-traumatic stress disorder, a triggering of past trauma and Martha von Tilling. And as we'll see, it's, it's really bad what happens to Martha on the departure of now Frederick von Tilling. So I'm going to read a passage and then we're going to talk about it. And this is on page 145. And this passage, just to set it up, um, is Martha reflecting on Frederick leaving for war. Again, page 145. It was a heartbreaking parting that occupied these last 24 hours. This was now the second time in my life that I had seen a dear husband depart to the war. But this second tearing ourselves apart was incomparably worse than the first. Then my way of taking it and still more Arno's was quite different and more primitive. I looked on the departure as a natural necessity, which overbalanced all personal feelings. And he looked at it even as a joyous expedition in search of glory. But now I knew that he who was going went to the work of death with horror rather than with exultation. So that's the end of the passage. And I did omit a couple of the sentences. Um, and she goes on to say that there, both Martha and Frederick are equally uh, upset, uh, horrified at this parting. Whereas before Arno, he looked at this as a joyous expedition in search of glory. But now um, Frederick is going with horror rather than with exaltation. And both, it's now both Martha and Frederick. And um, there are passages in this chapter where they basically think that he is not going to come back alive. And this is the last time they're going to see each other. Um, and so I just want to draw attention and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Riley to see if she wants to comment at all. But I want to draw attention to this sentence where she says, I looked on the departure as a natural necessity, which overbalanced all personal feelings. Um, this is something we talked about last time. And this is um, the balancing of these values or the hierarchy of values. And last time we looked at some passages where, you know, there's the view at the time that war is just, it's like a natural disaster. You can't control it, right? And because it's an, something natural that can't be controlled, you just have to resign yourself to it. But there's this realization that Martha has that this is something that we're choosing to do. And we looked at this passage last week that, you know, this is a, you have to make a distinction between warfare and natural disasters. And this passage in chapter six is, look, life is hard enough with natural disasters. Why do men create this other new horror, which just wreaks havoc on people, on families, on society, and so forth? So she begins, and, and Randy really talked about this, that this was like very new, that this idea that this is not natural, this is something that we're choosing to do. And so this sentence in chapter seven, I, again, I'll read it again. I looked on the departure as a natural necessity, which overbalanced all personal feelings. This was back then, chapter two. So back then she looks at it as natural necessity. And so she's not really feeling horrified as she is now. But now she's read, she's more mature. She's grieved for four years. She's remarried. Oh, and by the way, she's pregnant. And we'll get into some of these passages also because Frederick leaves 
as she's going into labor. This is happening in chapter seven. And so this is just as painful as it could possibly be, uh, number one, because this is something that human beings are choosing to do. And this is like how we've organized ourselves and it's not a good way to organize ourselves. Um, number two, she's going into labor and she wants her husband by her side. Number three, she's been through this before and it didn't, didn't go well, right? She grieved for four years. Um, and she has her best friend. Um, she's this new life and it's about to be ripped apart from her. So that's my comment on that sentence. And um, Riley, do you want to add anything to this passage on page 145? So um, in this passage, um, you talked about hope mostly in the sentence, I looked on the departure as a natural necessity, which overbalanced all personal feelings. Um, and you kind of focused on the natural necessity part. And I kind of want to like focus in on that because they also talk in, the, in their meetings where they're talking about how Frederick might not be coming back and they're looking at this as their last meeting. Frederick also brings up how, you know, childbirth is incredibly dangerous for both the child and the mother. And like, they don't, they kind of like let themselves forget about that, which will come back a bit later. But, you know, there's this like, you know, like you said, PTSD, there's this double whammy happening here of like, you know, now her husband's going off to war for the like her second husband's going off, she's already lost one. And like that in itself is painful enough. Now she won't have her husband here with her while she's like giving birth to their child. Um, and so like, they're both going off in these completely like opposite directions and in, into mortal danger. Um, and so like, they can't look at that as a joyous expedition in search of glory. Um, it just doesn't match up for them. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And, and this, the pain, like, as you say, double whammy, you know, it's like quintuple whammy. Um, and, and we'll talk more about that, that yeah, it's, it's so it's painful on many, many different levels. Um, and I would say probably more, more painful for Martha because she's, there's grief here and there's loss here already. And, and, I, we don't have to, to discuss, um, but I will say that um, I think it's in chapter seven when she's talking about these dreams, like she, these dreams that she's having in her psychosis. And she's like, she's, she's dreaming about Arno and Frederick at the same time. Um, they're both very present um, to, her, to her mind in this state of psychosis. But um. Continuing on with this, this theme of so much pain and this notion of like balancing the goods, right? And, and the, the reasons of state, right? Like she doesn't understand how this calculus, and she uses that phrase elsewhere, this calculus uh, can be. And so this is a, passage shortly thereafter. This is on page 146. And to me, it was no recompense, absolutely none, for my suffering to think that my dear one might perhaps gain a step in rank. And should the misfortune of this perilous separation rise to the still greater misfortune of parting forever, should Frederick fall, the reasons of state on account of this war had to be waged were not in the faintest degree elevated or holy enough to my mind to balance such a sacrifice. So that's Martha talking. And she's saying that, look, I've looked at the reasons of state. That was chapter six. And not in the, this is the very last, not in the faintest degree elevated or holy enough to balance the sacrifice of my dear one parting, nor is he gaining a step in rank. And some of like Mar Martha's father um, and others 
like I think Lori Griesbach and, and her husband, that's Martha's friend, they're still of this view that war is this arena whereby a man can distinguish himself and advance socially. Um, but even if Frederick can do this, this doesn't, this quote unquote gain doesn't at all balance the loss, right? So again, this, this calculus is not computing. And um, uh, as Randy said last time, so again, this, this book is published in 1889, a full 10 years before the Hague Peace Conference. And this is, and Bertha had a hard time publishing this. It was actually one of the publishers said it was offensive. <laughs> um, and so this is a very new way of looking at things that she is, she is advancing here through the character of Martha and then Frederick as well. So any thoughts on uh, the 146 passage, Riley? Yeah, I just wanted to add something to kind of connect it to the last passage from 145 um, that, you know, she's kind of still comparing this to when Arno left back in chapter two, because back then, you know, she had what she calls still kind of a childish view of it that like, you know, maybe Arno gaining a step in rank, you know, was something really good that could balance some of the risk, you know, even though it's mm horrible and painful but you know war is still kind of a glorious cause maybe you know mm -hmm. like she has this kind of back and forth but now by the time we're here in chapter seven and frederick's leaving just absolutely not mm -hmm. none of that is any consolation to her anymore mm -hmm. yeah that yeah thanks mm -hmm. that that contrast with uh, with chapter two and i think you know should you be you, meaning the listener, um, why are you listening to this? Sometimes people listen to these, you know, for like book reports or, or whatnot. But um, I think that, you know, chapter six and chapter two are, are, are or if you're a teacher, maybe uh, nice things to juxtapose as you're going through this text. Um, very good. Thanks for that. Um, and so page 148, 149, we're told that she goes into labor and loses, the Martha goes into labor and the baby dies. Um, and this is Martha writing again. She says, quote, my child died the day of its birth. The mental pain which parting from my beloved husband had caused me just at the time when I wanted all my strength to master the bodily pain had rendered me incapable of bearing up against it. Wow. Um, so again, this because of this mental pain, she's unable to properly deal with the physical pain. And as she says, bear up, this is the English translation, of course, but the English is bear up against it. And she just, her body succumbs and she loses the baby on the day of its birth. Riley, anything, any response, reaction there? I mean, with that one, just like what she says, it's kind of like, I don't know if there's anything to add. Yeah, yeah. So the, 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 we've read three chapters, so, or sorry, three, three passages in chapter seven, um, page 145, page 146, and this last one about the child dying is page 148 to 149. And, um, you know, we, we chose these passages because, again, like hierarchy of pains, hierarchy of goods, this calculus of pains and goods. And here she's, you know, making this claim that, you know, the, the mental anguish is a very powerful thing that can cause right, psychosomatic um, consequences because you're in so much mental pain. Um, and again, I wanna add into that, that her mental pain is not just Frederick leaving, but it's all of this, like the grief, she grieved for four years, right? So, so much pain already. And I think that this is reawakening, right? Re-traumatizing, triggering, a lot of difficulty at the time when she needs all of her mental strength to bear up against the physical pain. So in terms of a philosophical 
point of view, right? Like quote unquote, moral psychology, uh, I think is invoked here, um, especially as she makes these claims about the proper balancing of, of goods and how certain pains can work against other pains. Uh, so there's a lot to talk about there. We just wanted to flag those passages. Um, the next passage in chapter seven that we want to talk about is actually coming from Frederick von Tilling, because in chapter seven, um, it's, chapter seven is really devoted to Martha's convalescence, if you will, her dealing with Frederick's departure and absence. And at one point, she's starting to get a little bit better. And um, her, the people who are taking care of her give her these letters that Frederick has sent, and there's a packet of them, and she's reading them. And so this comes from a letter that Martha is reading. And so, you know, she's, she's writing about the contents of Frederick's letters. And so this is Frederick writing, and he says, and this is uh, on page 154, quote, but still better would it be if the science of artillery could progress to such a point that any army could fire a shot which would smash the whole army of the enemy at one blow. Then perhaps all waging of war would be entirely given up. Force would then, provided the total power of the two combatants were equally great, no longer be looked to for the solution of questions of right, unquote. Um, and this is very similar, if not identical, to something called the doctrine of MAD, mutual assured destruction, which is, you know, one of these doctrines used to justify nuclear armaments. And the idea is, look, if everybody has them, no one's going to use them because it's crazy to do so. Um, because if you use one, then you know that the other party will likely lose use one, and then the world would no longer exist as we know it. So of course, this is before this book is 1889. This is well before, and the sentiment is that Frederick is expressing is if we had a weapon so powerful enough that it could destroy the army with one blow or fire a shot, which would smash the whole army at one blow, as he says, then, you know, perhaps war would cease because this would be insane to engage in. But in fact, we do have that and it has not ceased, number one. But I wanted to draw attention to a uh, what Bertha von Sutner writes elsewhere. And, and this is one of the places where she writes it. This is actually a passage um, from Bridget Haman's biography, uh, Bertha von Sutner, A Life for Peace, originally published in German, translated into English. The link to that book, not the whole text, but if you, you know, want to learn more about it, where you can get it, there is a link on the show resources page at virtuesofpeace.com. It's a really great book and we'll likely do a podcast on some of its contents when we're done with this. But um, Bridget Hamann quotes this and she's translated, this is translated from the German into English. Um, I'm not gonna read the whole quote, but basically Bertha in this passage says, look, even if you have these really powerful armaments, so we, we know today that that's, this is not enough to end war, right? Um, but she very interestingly says, look, you have to look at armaments, not only in terms of the cost, their cost, because when you're spending so much money on these, weapons that can destroy the other party in one blow. Um, you're taking away money that the people could use for nourishment, enrichment, etc. But also the moral atmosphere created is not very neighborly. Um, that's my paraphrase. So I'm just going to read um, some of this quote. Armament has to be judged for the moral atmosphere it creates an atmosphere in which the joining of the people, the establishment of international law, let alone the feelings of brotherhood cannot prosper. It is not possible to smile with bared teeth and shake hands with bailed fists. 
Actually, it is incomprehensible that it is possible to live and be active at all in the midst of all these threats of destruction. And so she, she goes on. And so he, I think it's so interesting. Um, you have this, and she writes that in 1909. So that's 20 years after the, after, um, the publication of Lay Down Your Arms, which is 1889. And so you have Frederick saying, look, let's just make this weapon so horrible that we would never use it. Um, number one, that doesn't work. Number two, even if it does, there are other harms, as Bertha writes 20 years later. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all, Riley. Yeah, I just want to, like, emphasize the fact that, like, we have followed that, like, doctrine or idea, I guess, of mutual assured destruction. And, mm -hmm. like, here we are still having wars. So, exactly. you know, it, like, it, it's just ridiculous. And, like, especially that quote um, from Bridget Haman, it's like, you know, we it's incomprehensible that people could live in any like good or meaningful way mm -hmm. under that sort of threat because mm -hmm. like i don't know it it doesn't like you're not made safe mm -hmm. you know and and it, it becomes the sort of thing where like because it's not natural we can't forget about it you know, like, like, yes, there's always the threat of maybe there could be an earthquake or maybe there could be a tornado or whatever. And then that could happen at any time. And we can forget about that because there's like, literally, like, you can't do anything about that. That's just how it is. You can kind of put it out of your head until, you know, the weather starts acting up or whatever. But with like the building up of armaments, the building up of nuclear weapons, like, we can do something about that. Like, it doesn't have to be the case that we're creating this mm. atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. And uh, as we have said on this show, uh, there is the, the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force in 2021. Um, none of the nuclear powers has signed on to it, but um, it's a, a living thing and it's, it's a movement. And uh, well, there's a lot of work to be done and it's not really talked about at all in this country, but that does exist. Um, and the United States has argued that, uh, because people have tried to argue um, in a court of law that nuclear weapons are inherently um, inhumane, that they violate the principles of, of humanitarian law because for various reasons, they, you can't not affect civilians. They, these are not precision. We've talked about precision nuclear weapons. I think that is um, uh, semantics, and that's a very sneaky way of describing something that is cannot be precise. Um, but people have tried to argue that uh, because nuclear weapons are indiscriminate, that therefore they're inherently illegal. And the United States has argued there can be no inherently illegal weapons because in this case of nuclear weapons, you could have a political objective that's compelling enough that uh, makes them makes the, the use of them worth it, I'm paraphrasing. So um, anyway, a lot of work to be done. So we, we like to you know, point out that this text was written in 1889 translated into English in 18, there's a couple of translations, but I think the first one appeared in 1892. And uh, very few people even have heard of Bertha von Sutner, and most of her things have not been translated into English. So this passage, and I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't know German, and I'm a proud student of public, U.S. public education. Oh, um, it's, the German is Rüstung and Uber Ustung which according to Google Translate is Armament and Over Armament, published in 1909, not translated into English yet, we're working on it. Um, but anyway, there it is, right? The, uh, the number one with Frederick's remark, the, the articulation of this mutual assured destruct, destruction doctrine, and then 20 years later, 
uh, Bertha saying no to it because there are other consequences that we need to consider. Um, and not to mention, you know, mistakes with nuclear weapons, right? Or nuclear power, right? Which we, we have talked about in other shows. Um, human error, right? Um, which, is, which has happened. Okay, so the end, that's chapter seven, shall I say happily, um, does end. Frederick does, he goes off to battle and Martha is, is suffering and she's sort of like in and out of consciousness. And she's not even like, she thinks she's dreaming when he finally does actually return. Um, and that's how chapter seven ends with, she's sort of like realizing in her state of delirium that her husband is, has returned to her. Um, and then this is at, I think he's gone for probably about three or four months. Um, and so she's there, this, this, her losing the child and, and going into these, like a psych, psychosis and trauma, we reawake. And this is about a, a three, three month time span. And then he returns at the end of the summer of 1864. And so we'll move on to chapter eight and, um, Riley, I think uh, I'll turn it over to you to read some of these passages from chapter eight. Yeah, thank you. So um, the first passage I'm going to read um, is Martha reflecting on kind of um, what seems to be one of her first conversations with Frederick when he comes back, him uh, telling her about his experience while he was gone. Um, and so on page 167 follows, Frederick had to recount to me in detail all the dangers and sufferings which he had just gone through and to describe the pictures of horror from the battlefield and hospital which he had absorbed lately into his shuddering soul. I loved the tone of repugnance and pain which quivered in his voice during such recitals. From the way in which he spoke of the cruelties he had witnessed during the confusion of the war, I gathered the promise of an elevation of humanity, the result of which would be first in individuals, then in the many, and finally in all to overcome the old barbarity. Um, and just to stop on that for a moment, um, this is the way that Frederick talks to Martha specifically about what happens. Like he is very open with her about how horrible it was and like how much suffering he went through. And, um, you know, it's like this sort of pain, like you need someone else to bear witness to it with you. And this is very similar to, uh, I can't remember which chapter it is earlier on in the book. It might be chapter three or four where um, Martha finds out that um, I think one of her neighbor's sons or brother, someone has died in the war um, that Arno had fought in. And so she goes over to visit this person and she says it's out of like a duty, um, out of a sense of duty. And like, there's not like anything she could bring to her. It's just, she needs to sit there and cry with her. And so that's kind of what is happening here. Now Martha's doing that for Frederick. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And did you have anything you wanted to add hope before I go a little further yeah if i may i mean i just want to draw attention to this one sentence it's like the second sentence again this we're on page 167 and martha says i loved the tone of repugnance and pain which quivered in his voice during such recitals so frederick is his voice is quivering he's on the verge of tears Okay. From the way in which he spoke of the cruelties he had witnessed, blah, blah, okay. And so there's just this, he's sharing emotion with her um, and, and grief, right? And I just want to draw attention to that because this is going to be contrasted with the way that he speaks about his war experience with men um so uh that's all i want to say i just want to i just want to like set that up that this is this there's there's a contrast coming here 
yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and this ties in, Randy likes to say this all the time, he always talks about framing. Mm -hmm. And that's what Frederick is doing here. He's, you know, framing his story and his experience for his audience. So when he's talking to um, the generals and to other men involved, just other men and out in public, um, and so this is continuing on page 167. He contented himself with describing the tactical movements of the forces, the events of the battles, the names of the places taken or defended, recounting single camp scenes, repeating speeches which had been made by the generals and such like miscellanea of the war. Mm -hmm. And um, right after this, Martha kind of expresses some like disappointment mm -hmm. because she, because like, like she says um, earlier, after Frederick tells her in private, you know, she has this feeling of like a promise of the ele elevation of humanity, you know, and first it's starting with the individuals like Frederick, like her, and she's thinking that, okay, maybe let's share this and it'll come up in the many and then it'll finally overcome the old barbarity. But then she sees him talking to other soldiers this way. Mm. Um, and she kind of confronts Frederick about it. And he explains to her that, like, you know, he's not lying or going against his values. It's just a matter of decorum and sort of mm -hmm. like a time and a place. Mm -hmm. Just now, actually, I'm connecting this back to earlier, the very first episode when I talked about the preface to the second edition mm -hmm. um, is that the, the hope of this book is um, that it quote, may not lead so much to sentimental emotions and vague protests as to a business-like discussion of the means by which the resort to war may be at any rate rendered more and more infrequent. Mm -hmm. Now, he's not, you know, talking about, um, you know, how we can make war more and more infrequent. You know, he's saying good things about it to them, but it's kind of maybe the swinging back and forth of the pendulum in these different frames Maybe there's something here we can get to the middle and have this like business like discussion where we're still considering the suffering and emotions. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, clearly he's not sharing emotion with with the men. His voice is not quivering. He doesn't have a tone of repugnance and pain. And it's just very, you know, mechanical. Um and I mean, it's it's interesting the business like discussion. Um, you know what this book does is make very clear the impact of war on families and and making a stand like take taking a stand that this needs to be part of the calculus, right? Um, and is that quote sentimental or is that part of the business-like discussion? Uh, to me, it sounds like it's part of the business-like discussion. Um, but, no, I definitely yeah. agree with you there. It's it, just the terms of like the quivering in his voice is something that then becomes difficult. Uh, you know, it's so it's so interesting. So let's just let's just mark it, right? Um, you know, I, I didn't include we or we didn't include some of these passages. Um, I think they're in in chapter seven, where Martha is reading Frederick's letters, and um, um, he he says things like he actually uses the phrase "free thinking men." Um, that he absolutely abhors war and that he, he has to speak the truth. And he's writing this because he's on the, like, he thinks he's going to die and therefore he's compelled to speak the truth. And then he has a conversation, I think his name is Conrad, like the, their cousin who he sees in battle. And like Conrad is like, I, I love this. And, and Frederick is like, say the truth, man, you know, like speak to me as a man. I don't know if you remember that, that passage. Um, no, I do remember that. Yeah. And he's like, speak to me like a man. And, and, and Conrad is like, 
I am. And I, I, I still like, it's like, it's epic. It's just like an epic thing. And, and Frederick says, epic, that's the right word. But now, like maybe my first battle, I felt like that. But now it's not, it's not epic. And the, he says the, the poets, the poetry, it's false, that it's not glorious. It's not epic. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that those passages, um, and those are, I, I think those are in chapter seven. Um, those are useful, like this conversation that he has with his relative, right? And like, he can't speak that way, because like, he doesn't have a listener even, right? He doesn't have an audience. Like they just don't get it. He, Frederick is totally alone in this. Mm -hmm. He says free thinking. He, he actually said this passage, free thinking soldiers do think this way. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember that. I yeah. do remember that. You actually brought up something. Uh, so he says to his cousin, like, speak to me like a man. Like you can speak to me like a man. Like, mm -hmm. And then he says, oh, well, I am. Mm -hmm. And that right there is like, I want to focus in on that because I think that's such a huge piece mm -hmm. of what we're butting up against in the issues here mm -hmm. is the idea of what it is to be manly. Mm -hmm. Because being a soldier mm -hmm. in this way, like especially in this time, if we're considering the context, you know, the time they're in, the soldier profession, mm -hmm. like, showing any sort of emotion is super unmanly like you don't do that mm -hmm. and you know seeing the battle as anything but glorious and epic and awesome and this great chance for honor is like if you look at it any other way oh well that's not manly you know but frederick is coming from this other point of view of just being like Oh, I, I kind of see it as Frederick seeing that as like childish. Like that's not manly. That's childish. Like mm -hmm. that's what children mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so while he's over here, like talking about his suffering and like crying to his wife while explaining it, like that's manly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and oh, I'm forget. I'm forgetting exactly where it is, but. Um, I think it's Martha who, who maybe maybe in chapter eight, uh, you know, again this like que like questioning the legitimacy of this thing. You just don't do it because it's her father actually says something to her like you've never been much of a patriot, right? It's like un it's unpatriotic for you to think of your there, there it is. I'm remembering it now. Like to think of yourself, to think of the individual you know, as more important than like the state, yeah, is an unpa unpatriotic thing to do. And you, Martha, are just thinking about your own individual suffering. Um, I mean, there's that as well, that it's unmanly, it's unpatriotic, it's cowardly. There are all of these social norms built up against even the point of view being advanced here, much less by a soldier. Right. So again, that's why this book is so important. That's why it was such a, a bestseller translated into many different languages. And well, we don't know about it today. It's why we're doing the podcast. Thanks to Riley having the idea to do it. Riley. Thanks for having the podcast and helping me. <laughs> Thank you for helping me. Um, so anyway, this contrast of ways of speaking um and when what is manly i think that's these and these are themes that that bertha addresses in other other works absolutely um her last novel which is badly translated into english as when thoughts will soar um definitely the novel bef before that comes before lay down your arms which is das machina and zeitalter she talks a lot about these same ideas um, but let's let's move on, and I'll say, um, and then you, I'll ask you to read a couple more passages. Um, you do have in chapter eight uh, that they come to this agreement, Martha and Frederick, that he's going to quit. That when the peace treaty is signed, Frederick is going to no longer be a soldier, and and Martha has 
a little estate and uh, well Frederick needs something to do and so they agree that he will he will manage it um, and so they agree on this plan but um, uh, later on those plan those plans are destroyed um, because Martha loses her private fortune and and he and Frederick could no longer retire. And so that comes at page 178, but before, and we'll go into a passage at page 171, um, they do agree. So at this point, um, they're ready, they're mature enough to, to live out their principles. Um, and Frederick agrees that it, it's time to yeah, quit the service. And over to you, Riley, to talk about this passage on 171. Yes. Um, so before we get into the passage, um, they have also kind of decided, so at this point in the book, it's been long enough that Rudolph is kind of becoming a character, Martha's son mm -hmm. that she had with Arno, like he's finally old enough that he's not just like a baby. Um, and mm -hmm. so you're getting to see some of, some of the things he's doing, some of his personality more. Um, and before earlier when he was an infant Arno and Martha had talked about how he was going to be a soldier someday and making all these plans for him and now Frederick and Martha talk about you know he's definitely not going to be a soldier we won't allow it like maybe he'll be a diplomatist or mm -hmm. something whatever um not whatever but <laughs> <laughs> and mm -hmm. so yeah so they like wanted to like hide those not hide those things from him but basically not try to try not to instill in him like a love for war um and so on page 171 we have above all things unbearable to me were the soldiers games which not only my father but my brother carried on with the boy the idea of the enemy and cutting down were thus instilled to him i know not how one day, Frederick and I came up as Rudolph was mercilessly beating two whimpering young dogs with a riding switch. And um, as he's beating these dogs, one of them, he calls it like a dirty Italian and he calls the other one like a lying Dane or something like that. Um, and Frederick grabs the riding crop from him and hits him on each shoulder and says, and like, and that's um, like a, a mean Austrian so like a mean Austrian or something like that um cruel Austrian yeah a cruel Austrian yeah <laughs> and then he like quickly apologizes to Mar Martha like I am not a fan of corporal punishment like I'm sorry for hitting your son and she's kind of like well if there's a time to like and, and you know it's kind of like to show him like you hit like you're hurting those dogs they did not do anything to you mm -hmm. and then they kind of get in this conversation and rudolph is trying to understand why he can't hit the dogs and he's like oh so it's only okay to hit people and frederick's <laughs> like no 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 and he's like but you you hit people you're a soldier and he's like well those are our enemies um and it's like so we're allowed to hit our enemies because they hate us and it's like well no 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 it's because like they hit us and it's like well then why did they hit us be oh well because they thought we were gonna and then he kind of like just mm -hmm. goes off and he's like oh wait i don't have a way out of this circle mm -hmm. and okay we'll run all run along and play rudolph don't hit dogs <laughs> <laughs> um, and the scene too is like it seems kind of like a simple scene of like i don't know disciplining a child but it's more important it gets this whole theme of like why are we in a war like if it's only okay to hit someone if you're acting in self-defense and they on the other side acknowledge it's only okay to hit someone if you're acting in self-defense well how did we start hitting in the first place mm -hmm. you know like when, is there is it ever okay to start war it seems like no mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes and the other interesting thing about this passage is just this bit about cruelty to animals, um, which Bertha writes about elsewhere, definitely in Das Maschinenzeitalter, she has a whole section on vivisection and how cruel it is. Um, and that this is like a, a foreshadowing and we just you know, had another school shooting. <laughs> I mean, we, we did this show we, we picked up, we had a seven month hiatus because 
of the the war in Ukraine, right? And it was our two year anniversary. And and in that time, like the war is still going on. Um, and and then we have these shootings in the United States. And uh, I remember reading, and who knows, I haven't, you know, done my my fact checking on the the young man who bought these AR-15 assault weapons uh, for his 18th birthday. Uh, but one of them said he, you know, there's a history of his cruelty to animals. <clears throat> um, and this is kind of an indicator, like when you're cruel to animals is, you know, there's something psychologically amiss and, um, or boys will be boys. I've heard that as well. But I just, uh, I think this is an interesting uh, gloss. Um, I just want to say, Bertha talks about it elsewhere, that there's this link. It's also in Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, that this cruelty to animals is a gateway, if you will, to larger, and perhaps that's a discriminatory way of putting it, um, but you know, ex an exp expansive cruelty, um, that this is not, not a good thing and it needs to be checked. And, and Martha's character says that she abhors cruelty to, to, to animals. So there's a, a link between violence done to humans and violence done to animals. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to flag that. And these war games um, also, you know, there's literature on, on, uh, on video games and, and the young man who, who uh, shot up the, the children in their school. Um, and the, the marketing of these these weapons are done is very you know strategically done by these gun companies um, who target young men um, who play Fortnite and other types of, of of games that involve killing. And so there's a, actually an interesting book called On Killing. I forget the guy who wrote it. It's probably about twenty to thirty years old, but how. Uh, these violent video games almost normalize violence. Um, and so, you know, you have this kind of sentiment here too. And I, 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 I'm pretty sure it was Bertha who was being interviewed where she, she was asked, um, do you really think we should, you know, not have, you know, soldiers games for boys? And she says, I think we can do better. Right, like we, we can come up with, with better games than that. Um, so I'll stop and I don't know if you wanna say anything else or if we yeah. can move on, go ahead. I just wanted to like say a little bit there mm -hmm. um, with games and stuff and it's like, yeah, we can do better. Cause I don't know, there's so many different kinds of video games out there. Like not all of like, and it's interesting because um, from my perspective, as I'm watching like, different things you know there's different obviously like you know different groups like areas of interest what have you but like I don't know there's games where like you go around and just like I don't know find friends or like build your house or like, like farm farmville yeah farmville but like there's even like complicated ones and like <laughs> that's cool and you know I think it's even fine to like have fun playing a video game, but it's the way that they get marketed and used that becomes a huge, huge issue. And when it's like mm -hmm. focused on just the games that are like really realistic, because like it, it like like Call of Duty is the example I want to pull out mm -hmm. as like, I don't know, it's kind of horrifying to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then. Yeah, and then just connecting with cruelty to animals, something else I wanted to add on to that was that, like, um, you know, in, like, right now, true crime is super popular. A lot of people are really interested in podcast shows, what have you. Um, and when they're focused on serial killers, something you see almost every time without fail is cruelty to animals before they accelerate into something else. Mm. Mm. So yeah, that was kind of off topic, but just wanted to throw that all in. So yeah, it's it's it needs to be it, it needs to be dealt with if it is being witnessed, um, and we'll just we'll leave it at that. Yes. Uh, so 
page 178, there is a quote. Uh, if you could read it, I'll, I'll uh, comment on it. Yeah, um, this quote is kind of connecting us back to um, kind of where we started at the episode. Mm. Um, I'll just read it. Um, so page 178. Sunshine follows after rain, and in the sunshine, one forgets the rain. Even after earthquakes and eruptions of volcanoes, men build up new dwellings again and do not think of the danger of a repetition of the past catastrophe. A chief element in our life's energy appears to reside in forgetfulness. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope I'll let you comment on that one first. Yeah, like you said, it definitely relates to how we begin. Um, and this juxtaposition between Frederick's departure and Arno's departure five years earlier, her first husband. There's certain things that are very hard to forget. And do you really forget them? Um, your subconscious memory, I would say, or some part of you, your body remembers. Um, but I, I find this passage really interesting. Um, this last sentence, a chief element in our life's energy appears to reside in forgetfulness. And I, as, as you know, Riley, and if you listen to the show, um, it's all about what we call positive history. And um, there, I, I would say a chief element in our life's energy um, should reside in remembrance, uh, especially of inspiring motivating stories um so i just so two things um we we want to forget the bad things um and we need to move forward when bad things happen but sometimes it's very hard to and one has to properly properly uh, address it so there's a, a term in german i think i've, I've may have used it on the show before, but the term is and it's the word that Germans use to refer to reckoning with a difficult past that you've got to face, you've got to like own up to it, look at it, and then move on. Um, and that's number one. Number two is we shouldn't just reside in forgetfulness to move forward. Um, life's energy, she connects with forgetfulness, and I'm going to say, um, even more energy can reside in remembrance of inspiring stories and work that has been, that has begun, but is calling on this generation of folk to continue it, period, I'm done. <laughs> um, <laughs> so something I wanted to add to that is like, there is like, we need to forget some things in order to go on um and you know we kind of naturally do that and if we just let it happen that way we end up with you know war <laughs> mm -hmm. um but there's a way that you know we do this on purpose like you just said you know coming to terms with a difficult past and then you set it behind you mm -hmm. like you're not erasing it forever you're not pretending it didn't happen you're just like you don't think about it because yeah, if you, you thought about it, you'd be wasting so much of your energy and your time. Like you sit with it, you reckon with what has to be reckoned with. Yeah. And then there's other things that we do need to remember, like positive history. It's important to remember. And even bad things are important to remember. Yes. But like there is a great, great power in being able to like forget things sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And I would say like maybe again, Randy, reframe. Um so with these difficult things, the terrible things happen and we move on by reframing and, and mm -hmm. coming up with a new narrative of the event and sculpting a new self-concept. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, um, I, 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 just, I because... found this very, very interesting. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, I, think, I think that's a really great way to put it because... Um, specifically, what she says here, I'm going to focus on even after earthquakes, mm -hmm. um, build up men build up new dwellings again and do not think of the danger of a repetition. Well, you know, that that's kind of true. But, you know, we have 
skyscrapers that we've built that have pendulums in them that swing so that they can kind of wiggle a bit. So when there's an earthquake, they don't come crashing down and falling. But we don't sit and think and worry, oh no, there's what if there's an earthquake? We have to like constantly be ready to like run out if there's going to be an earthquake. Like, no, you can forget about it, but we didn't completely forget about it. Like we mm. remembered what happened. So we fixed our infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So when we rebuilt, we rebuilt better so mm. that, you know, when it happens again, mm -hmm. it'll be okay. And we don't have to think about it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Right. So we're coming to the end of chapter eight and there's just one last <laughs> kind of twisted. Um, it's, we don't really have a, a quote, but, you know, an event. And I, I know, um, Riley, you wanted to talk about this Lori Greasebox April Fool's joke. Um, it's how um, chapter eight ends. It's not a very nice joke. No, opinion. it's kind of a terrible joke. It's god awful. It's and, and, so, and it's so mean. It's, it's so mean. It's, it's it's she's a cruel Austrian. Clearly, <laughs> she's a um, cruel Austrian. That's right. <laughs> um, it, so yeah, but I just want to say, like, even before she does this, Martha is like, oh, you know. Lori Griesbach has been coming over more and I'm, I find her, the English translation is even more insipid and awful. Like she's just, <laughs> she's just like, but she's I, also saying, but she's still my friend and yeah. I still like that she comes over, but maybe a bit too much. <laughs> yeah. So she's Lori Griesbach is starting to get on the nerves of, of Martha in part because I love, I love the English translation. Lori Griesbach is, is being quote coquette coquettish and batting her eyes at Frederick and flirting with him and so forth. And this is really upsetting Martha. Yeah, um, it's yeah. very upsetting to Martha. And like Lori even comes up and talks to her about and like mm. tells her how like Frederick's so handsome and how she'd like should keep an eye on him. Mm. And they kind of like have like a little like oh ha ha laugh about it. And then Martha's like, but I'm actually feeling like super angry and terrible. Yeah, because there's truth and jest. She actually says right. so there's truth yeah there's in truth and jest yes so anyway and we have this joke like i'll just let you talk about it and i'll be quiet <laughs> I'll, um, I'll try to be quiet you can try you can hard, try hard to do <laughs> so basically um martha gets this letter um and it is basically saying that um you know it's from an anonymous sender who knows that uh, Frederick isn't being faithful to her and um, he has a lover and this person who's writing has proof that's enclosed in this little envelope in like a separate packet I guess um, and she's really upset by this and kind of Frederick looks up at her and is like you know what's the matter with you <laughs> <laughs> and she kind of they have this conversation and she brings it up and he's like App like this is ridiculous. He says infamous. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so basically he's just like, I would absolutely never do this. And like they hug each other and she's like, look into my eyes. And um, yeah. And she, and he just says like, do you doubt me? Um, I would never do this. And she's like, you know what? You're right. Like, I believe you. I'm not even going to look at this proof. I'm going to throw it in the fire. And he kind of jumps and goes, wait, 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 no, take it. Let's see. Like, we need to see what this, like, what is it? What is it? <laughs> and so they pull out this letter or a little note um, that Frederick had dictated when Martha had hurt her hand. And it says, my Lori, come. I am anxiously expecting you today at 5 p.m. Martha, parentheses, still a cripple. <laughs> <laughs> and so they are like oh the person who saw this like obviously didn't understand the meaning because the note was supposed to be signed from Martha and she's still a cripple that's why Frederick it's in Frederick's hand right <laughs> not saying that Martha's still a cripple so I'm gonna come see you <laughs> um, and then and the, like it's just kind of sweet because it's like um here actually wait I'll finish before I come back to that so then Martha goes to visit Lori and is just kind of saying this horrible thing happened like someone thought that um 
Frederick was cheating on me with you. Can you believe that? It's so silly. And here, look at this note. This is the note that they thought. And Lori is just laughing, laughing, laughing. And then she's like, uh, Martha, you're like, I sent you this letter, Martha. Like, look at the back. And it says it's dated April 1st. Mm-hmm. And she's just like laughing with them. Yeah. And just, it, it's just so funny because it's like, it was supposed to be this funny joke, but it's so mean and awful. It is. And you think too, kind of in the scene, maybe it'll drive something between them. And I almost do think, I wonder if Lori maybe intended it to drive something between them. Mm. Um, But then it ends up the scene where they're talking, it brings them so much closer because Martha's like, you know, I don't know who wrote this letter. I don't even need to look at this paper. Like, I I trust you, you know? Mm -hmm. I think that's Mm -hmm. kind of beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's a... It's, it's definitely a cruel joke. Um, and yes, it, if, if Lori's scheme was to drive them apart, yeah, it totally backfires. So, oh, well. And um, that's really how chapter eight ends, no? Yeah, it ends right there. Like, that's the last scene. Yeah. Yeah, it says, have you not then turned the enclosure around? See here, on the back of it is written my name and the date, April 1st. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so ends chapter eight. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, I, you know, we always go around, so to speak, with um, final thoughts and so forth. And um, I'll just say um, these chapters... Uh, as I said before, I think it's very it's very useful. You know, we're doing this in pieces, and it was a seven month hiatus before we picked up with chapter six. Uh, and I, I think that's unfortunate. I think it's 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 good to read these together. And I found myself because I was trying I was trying to really understand like where are we again and what year is this? And so I found myself going back to earlier chapters. Um, and so I think. I said it earlier to juxtapose these chapters with, you know, chapter two, definitely, which is when Arno leaves. And we've stressed these themes of, you know, going from immaturity to maturity. And that involves a different calculus of values. You definitely see that very much so in these chapters. Um, You see this comment on, on gender, as we talked about, I think that's really important. And we're going to see, um, you know, foreshadowing, if you will. Um, Frederick, uh, although, you know, his plans were dashed, uh, like, so what happens with him now that he has this, this insight in what is truly precious to him and he doesn't want to do this again, right? So, so what happens? Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and Riley, you have the last word. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> honestly, I, I think it is unfortunate that we had to take such a long break, but at the same time, I'm kind of grateful for mm. having, for being able to go back to what we did with completely fresh eyes and ears and like we listen to some of the podcasts, we read some of the chapters because mm. now these themes running through and the juxtaposition is a very obvious to me whereas before it wasn't even though this is like my Mm. third time reading the book Mm. it's just having like the deep conversation we had going Mm. back to that again Mm. and being able just to connect where we're at now it's really really cool and I'm grateful for that me too and I you know I think that reading is you know one level of understanding discussion another and then writing yet another and I think that all of these activities need to be engaged in to process adequately the set of ideas and values here and uh absolutely yeah and and we live in a world where it's just it's quite difficult to do that right I mean the way that we've organized this society it's I I find it very difficult even though it's my job (laughs) as a professor to engage in these activities in earnest, Um, read, write, discuss. There are a lot of other things invading our lives um, 
And so I think that this is an extremely important activity. And uh, thank you, Riley, for for joining me in the processing of these these themes in this important book. Thank you, Hope. I'm happy mm -hmm. to be here. Mm -hmm. So we will come back in a couple weeks, probably with chapters nine and ten. Until then, you have been listening to Virtues of Peace. This was part four of our mini series on Bertha von Sutner's Lay Down Your Arms. Thank you, Riley. Have a good evening and see you in a couple of weeks. Good night. Good night. <laughs>